Hello, and welcome to our interview with Terrapin Strategies. Today, we're going to dive into the exciting world of government affairs and learn more about the services and vision of this innovative company. We're going to talk with Jason. He's the founder of Terrapin, a government relations consulting firm. He has extensive experience in executive, legislative, and regulatory affairs at the federal and state level, having served in the U.S. House of Reps and managed government affairs portfolios for various organizations. He's currently building a zero to one government affairs platform with the aim of changing the way government relations are conducted. Have you ever wondered what a government affairs company does? They provide a roadmap for clients to identify their initial problems and differentiate the signal from the noise. Terrapin Strategies aims to be a zero to one government affairs platform, changing the way government relations are conducted. Like SpaceX, they're not afraid to crash and burn in pursuit of their goals. So sit back and enjoy as we talk to Jason at Terrapin Strategies. Hello, Josh Laddick here with GSA Focus, and today we're with Jason Fry at Terrapin Strategy. How are you doing today, Jason? Great, Josh. Thanks for having me. Good, good. Well, it's a Friday. I don't know if that'll work for our benefit, if you'll be like, you know, nice and ready for the weekend and loose on the interview. Oh, I'm, I've, already, like... I've already got my water slash moonshine here, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, everybody meet Jason. He is with Terrapin Strategy, and Jason is a government affairs or government relations specialist, which I know very little about. So I'm going to lean on Jason to kind of, you know, answer a lot of the questions that are very, very basic. So if you don't know much about what a government relation expert does, you're about to learn. Um, but let's start it off with just kind of like a biography of you, Jason. I dug through your LinkedIn and um, a lot of interesting stuff in there. So yeah, go ahead and, and tell everybody. You know, I, I think it's a road less traveled, the poem, right? Uh, that was the motto of my freshman class in college. You know, I, you know, there's two roads in the diver, you know, diverted wood and I chose the road less traveled. And that was, that's definitely Jason's route. And no, I'm from St. Paul, originally in Minnesota. I'm about 30 miles east of there now. And, you know, grew up in, you know, kind of an interesting place. Uh, it's called St. Paul's North End Frogtown, but it's like the, um, if you've ever seen the movie Grand Torino, where that story actually takes place, mm -hmm. uh, is where I was born and, and lived until I was a couple years old. And, you know, sort of in that 80s tweener space, right? So I'm like, some people don't know if I'm a Gen X or if I'm a millennial and I'm not really sure I, I know or care either, but I've got my opinions. Uh, but yeah, so from Minnesota, always wanted to work in government, always wanted to end up in you know DC or in the military or something. I didn't exactly know what that was gonna look like, but I definitely knew that, that was gonna be you know my path. And so on my fourth day back to college, on my fourth day of college, 9-11 happens and you know, obviously that's a pretty monumental moment. I'm standing there going, okay, well, I've, I've got my Pearl Harbor moment. And, you know, the Marine, Marine Corps is in my blood from World War II, Korea, Vietnam. And I said, okay, well, this is my, you know, this is my decision point and which one am I going to do? And so I chose to, to my mother's chagrin to drop out of school and join the Marines. And the verdict is still out if that was a good decision or not, right? <laughs> like, should I have done that? Should I have not done that? Uh, but I'm, I'm definitely glad I did. And I went to go fight, you know, the Taliban, right? Revenge 9-11 and never went to Afghanistan. Uh, went to Iraq a couple of times. And there was where I sort of learned, you know, how foreign policy works, how that little game of chess gets played. And that just intrigued me more. And, and I kind of felt like, you know, at one point I was the tip of the spear, but at the other point, it kind of felt like you were in the back of the room. Like you were the last to find out. It seemed like everybody knew what we were doing before we were gonna do it. And, but yet we were the ones actually maybe doing something. And, and it was the second deployment that I was in was right when the war started to really devolve, right? And it was not looking good. And so the political sort of narrative about the Iraq war kind of took over. And again, just brought me one step, you know, deeper down and more interested. Uh, so I get out, move back to Minnesota, and immediately start my prep, my path, you know, right towards getting into the government. I had no idea, again, how. Um, so I ended up interning for a local radio show. Uh, the host ended up becoming a member of Congress, actually, Jason Lewis, great guy. And I get an internship in Congress. I'm 27 years old. I'm an intern in Congress. I'm taking the trash out. I'm older than half the staffers. 
And so then, uh, you know, work my way up, get a job. Then they offer me a spot in DC doing defense and foreign policy issues. And, you know, just of course love that. But then I discovered this whole other policy world, right? You know, insurance, transportation, you know, technology, immigration, you know, stuff that had nothing to do with defense, nothing to do with foreign policy, but definitely like, you know, they're all sort of different um, legs of the same sort, different spokes of the same wheel. And so then I left the Hill. Uh, I worked for Tom Emmer and uh, was his legislative director and left the Hill uh, in 20, like late 2016, early 2017, went off into the policy world and started focusing on all these other crazy things like flying cars, driverless cars, kind of before that was like in vogue, right? And, you know, deregulation and looking at not so much deregulation, but smart regulation. And then uh, moved back to Minnesota in 2018, um, worked for a large company uh, that focused on uh, records for insurance companies and employers. And so like making sure that the transportation and insurance systems and employment systems of our country work properly. So just again, a deeper dive into that data space, mm -hmm. um, worked with a fantastic firm and then started Terrapin Strategies. And that's kind of how you and I got connected. And yeah, so what Terrapin is trying to do, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but is again, we're, we're a startup in the government affairs space, right? So most of the time people, if they know what government affairs is, they kind of think maybe just hard lobbying or you know one government talking to another government. And so what we are is sort of that hybrid where we're a startup in the, in the government space that we interface between either government to government, you know, pure, you know, intergovernmental affairs or company to government, person to government. And um, we build and develop strategies for companies that need to, or individuals that need to engage um, with government entity, or they've got business opportunities, uh, you know, so maybe they want to enter the government market and they need to sort of understand uh, where the guardrails are, and we help uh, design and develop and execute those strategies. Very good, very good. Well, thanks for all that. That's, you covered a lot of ground there in a couple minutes. Around the world in three minutes. <laughs> cool, and it was, a, that was a really good segue into the first topic, which like I mentioned before, I know very little about government affairs. So, uh, you know, just to throw kind of lob it out there, what do you do? You know, what are the services that you offer? Who are your customers? That kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So what we offer in terms of services, this is what we call like the government affairs roadmap or like the on-ramp offering. We kind of, we don't really market that or talk about that like externally. What that is, is uh, essentially like if you think of like your average person, right, that's like needs to go to the store. And uh, they go, okay, well, I'm gonna walk out of my house and I've got a choice. I've got Target or I've got Walmart and I need to kind of choose between Target and Walmart. So I kind of need to know the pros and cons of either or. And that's a product that we call Snapshot where it's basically saying, okay, which way's up? And you know, that's really a, a great product or an, for an entry level person that's looking at going, okay, I don't need to spend a million dollars and I don't need to spend a thousand dollars. And, you know, but I need to know what my initial problem is. And so we, we can diagnose and break down those problems uh, quickly and then help focus. Um, Cause you know, there's a lot of noise, right? So we're separating signal from noise there. When you're going to the next phase, what we talk about a lot is initial conditions. And that's sort of like a startup term, right? A zero to one, you know, Elon Musk term that a lot of people in government maybe don't necessarily understand. But in the, in the business world, you know, initial conditions are incredibly important. Uh, because you're technically starting something from scratch where, you know, government's 250 years old. And then if you want to go further back, you've got the Magna Carta. So like representative democracy or republics have been around for thousands of years. And so it's kind of like a continuous clock. But with a company that's re getting ready to engage, you're maybe starting from square one. And so what we do is build and develop strategies for those companies coming out of that, like, okay, they know what their problem is, or they know what their issue is. Now they're ready to engage. Now they're ready to sort of like develop a strategy. And so we build that one. So then now you're like, you know, you're on your way to Target, you're on your way to Walmart, and now you're on the freeway. And that's where you're, you're in an operational perspective, right? You might need a whole lot more capabilities. You might need real-time analytics, tracking, monitoring of legislation or regulatory actions. You're needing constant updates about, you know, where something is progressing or going. Um, you know, we've got clients that, you know, maybe sometimes just want to sort of know what's going on. And then there's an operational phase and then it's time to go, right? And so you've got to be you know, your, all of your resources marshaled and directed in the right way. And then there's sort of the off-ramp, right? You're going, you're, you've chosen Target because I'm from Minnesota. So of course you choose Target. And so you're getting off the freeway 
but you're still gonna make sure that you're getting there safely. And so you've got to watch what you're doing afterwards. Um, maybe you've gotten your regulatory thing, you know, your agenda passed, or maybe that bill that you wanted um, defeated is lost, but you've got to make sure you're maintaining your eyes uh, and your attention to a particular issue. Um, so we built those products and services based on sort of the needs of different companies at different phases of the game. So you don't necessarily need to do all four. Um, you certainly could, and we, we would encourage that, but I think that's probably the best way to phase it. But everybody's different, and it can't be a one-size-fits-all. It's got to fit them. Okay, great, great. And what are these kind of pointed at? Like, is it kind of pointed at an industry, and then if possible, even maybe clear away some of the industry to go a little deeper into a niche of some sort so that, you know, is it kind of like tracking the news, building and tracking relationships with Congress people, um, just kind of in any, is it, yeah, so if you could kind of maybe give an anecdotal example, um, right. customer or just a made up situation where somebody can kind of track along with you on this on-ramp initial conditions, operational, and then off-ramp, what that kind of looks like. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, I'd like to give an example sort of, of of myself. I went off into a into a new role, kind of didn't really fully understand the space. Like, I mean, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know, you know, maybe the where the guardrails were. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying like, man, I wish there was a service that would tell me where my guardrails were and help me out. So I built it. But is what you got to understand is like a company, what a lot of companies think is that, oh, I'm just going to yell at the government, or I'm just going to tell the government, or I'm just going to ignore the government um, because they're too slow or they're unresponsive, they're not helpful, um, or it's, it's too risky. A lot of companies are afraid to engage because it's like, oh man, once the legislature gets a hold of this thing, it's all over, right? We can't control it. And to a certain extent, that's true. But at the same time, if you've got, let's say, a, a prototypical company, that is looking uh, maybe to pass a piece of legislation, right? Because that's what most people, you know, like the schoolhouse yeah. rock, I'm just a bill, right? And so you're, you know, we work in, you know, my wife and I like to do a lot of gardening. And so, you know, we work, uh, you know, we sell um, fertilizer and, you know, we just sell fertilizer so people can grow their plants. And then Vladimir Putin decides to invade Ukraine. And now all of a sudden your fertilizer prices have quadrupled and your supply chain is destroyed. And, there's this one little regulatory piece that, or an exemption that could be given that could open your market back up and you could get your product to your customers. And so you identify that, you know, maybe through a government affairs person or maybe even your, your counsel or yourself. Yeah. You go, okay, well, this particular, you know, regulation makes it harder for me to get X type of fertilizer in. Um, yeah. But what you would do, right, is you, again, establish the guardrails, understand what it is that you're trying, you know, to accomplish. And let's say it's you know, either whether it's regulatory or legislative, mm -hmm. and you de build and develop that strategy and, and, and go and execute. And I think that's where a lot of people get hung up on government affairs is they think it's just, oh, somebody with a bag full of cash goes in, it's all corrupt. No, there's, you know, there's PACs, there's fundraising, there's all kinds of things. Um, but those are drops in the bucket compared to, you know, it's I think $20 billion a year industry across the United States. Um, you know, we've got a $25 trillion GDP. So, I mean, you're talking minuscule amounts of money um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So most of that work is that is done is, you know, with a government affairs person hand in hand with a company or an association pushing a particular policy or, or a regulatory issue to open up markets or to close markets or whatever it might be. Um, so I think there's some misconceptions about what, what government affairs is. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, I appreciate you taking me through that. Um, is the goal, you, how, how often is the goal to pass legislation? Is there anything else that a government affairs per, uh, specialist would do other than try to get legislation through? Yeah, literally, it's, it's almost like limitless. So, what, you know, what, just from Terrapin's perspective, you know, we help companies, you know, maybe track or pass legislative uh, mm -hmm. issues. Maybe there's a particular regulatory issue that they need help with. Um, sometimes it's just relationship building, right? Like, you know, you have an existing relationship with a particular agency or entity or know how, you know, I, what I tell people a lot is, hey, acknowledge in government that there's always going to be a door and that door is there for a reason. But mm -hmm. what does every door have? You know, it's got a keyhole. So you just got to find the right key and the, and the strategy that gets, you know, your key into the door. And that's, you know, kind of at the end of the day.
And so what, you know, what a government affairs person is going to do is um, different things depending on what you need. So if, if you've got a legislative issue, right, you're going to handle it one way. If you've got a regulatory issue, which is te- typically means like Congress has passed a law, they pass along authority to an agency or a department and said, okay, you've got 18 months to promulgate a rule and then two years or whatever it is after that to initiate regulations. Well, then there's the whole fight between, well, congressional intent versus what the administrative state is choosing to do, right? And we always hear about the separation of powers and the difference between the legislature and the executive. And so, you know, in that on-ramp, off-ramp experience, uh, you know, sort of uh, example I gave earlier, is that's why it's really good to engage early on, right? Be, and then not say, okay, right, you know, bill one, two, three passed because the executive may come and, ha- and interpret it very differently than Congress did. And if you're, you know, you're going along thinking, oh, hey, House Bill one, two, three just passed and I'm in the clear. And then you go to start selling your product only to find out that it's illegal to do so or something, right? You, you jumped off the chip too soon. So mm-hmm. you could do regulatory, you could do um, legislative, there's lobbying, right? Sort of the hardcore, you know, like go in, sit down, make a pitch, you know, more like the sales version of government affairs. Um, but, you know, but that's mostly relational. And there's also business development, right? So you're looking for, you know, connections within, you know, maybe you want to be a contractor for the government, um, you know, which is something similar to like, you know, to GSA Focus, we want to get into a particular market, um, mm-hmm. sell or buy from the government, um, you know, so to help either identify opportunities, RFPs, grant loan opportunities, um, but also to finding connections that you may not know exist, whether it be associations, um, whether it be, you know, more political actions, um, you know, there's a lot of people in a lot of spaces and, and, you know, if you're one company, you're head down focused on your mission and your customers. And so having that assistance to do business development um, is an un, maybe like an unappreciated factor that government affairs can do. And I think that, you know, the smart companies are the ones that are engaging in those things. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit. So that, that gives, I I think I have a very clear picture now of, uh, you know, what someone in government affairs or public affairs does. Your company's different though. You do all those things, but you also have the startup aspect. Um, So there's a lot more innovation. You're not just a crusty old man that's really well connected that says pay me money and I'll pull the string for you it's there's a lot more to it and um you're leveraging technology in fact I, you know going across your website I'm sure you're the only uh you know government affairs specialist that uses the word stack you know that's yeah. <laughs> that was like it popped out I was like oh that's cool because I tried that lately I've been thinking of like it, things in those terms so um We've talked about this before, zero to one, good book. After you recommended it to me, I read it on like a three hour flight, cover to cover. Awesome, good job. Great read. Anybody out there that hasn't read zero to one, uh, you gotta do it. It, So a quote that I pulled out from the book, actually, I was going through my highlights yesterday just to try to kind of like to do that, you know, go back to a book (laughs) and look through your highlights. A great company is a conspiracy to change the world. So it's always good to get that kind of perspective and take our pull our heads out of the fog of day-to-day operations and all that stuff and ask, what's my mission? So as far as you know, Terrapin strategies, kind of like, you know, what what's your conspiracy to change the world? And for one, and then I'd also love to get into your stack and your specific tools and kind of some of the exciting stuff that you're, you know, what what are some of the tools that you've had built or that you've built that are uh, you know, exciting. Like you, you had a little bit, you had a little vision, but you started building it and it got it turned into a big vision. But yeah, first question, you know, what's your conspiracy to change the world? Oh, wow. That is a really, I wasn't prepared for that one. So really good <laughs> question. If anything, it, just between you and me and nobody else, what I would say is that I feel that and you know the public polling, and we'll, and we'll get into some of these questions I think later. But as you know, public polling is showing that people have lost faith, and you know 2020 was a, was a tough year for for everybody, and you know 2021 was tough, and 2022 has been tough. And as you know, as I'm having children, as I'm like advancing in my career, I'm I'm going, man, this is just not the way this was supposed to work. You know, I just sort of had that like moment where I'm just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not buying this. And 
if I'm going to be able to stay in this career, if I'm going to be able to stay in this space, I'm going to have to do it differently. Yeah. And maybe not so much like that, you know, that everybody was going to do it the way I did it, right? But that the only way I was going to be able to continue to do it is if I was going to do it the way I thought that I had to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that comes from my faith or from my experience, a couple of different things. But my conspiracy to sort of change the world is that I think that one of our, one of our core values at Terrapin is to love what you do and who you're doing it for. And I think that we love startups. You know, I think America is sort of, you know, driven by startups to a certain extent. And we started to look and go, I mean, these companies are, are changing the world. And, and while everybody is over here chasing, um, you know, the big companies, right? Everybody wants to work for 3M or Target or, you know, Best Buy here in Minnesota, right? Or some of the larger companies. Um, I said, well, I, I want to work for the companies that are going to be, you know, those companies in a hundred years, in a thousand years and, and stop. So my conspiracy is, is that we as Americans need to stop thinking about only ourselves and only right now. And the government actions that are taken have ramifications forever in some cases. Um, you know, using all of our natural resources, space flight, you know, nuclear technology, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Supersonic flight, you know, artificial intelligence, I mean, these, these will change history forever. And we've got to stop thinking about it in you know, quarterly earnings reports or how much did I make this week? Um, start thinking about what world are you creating in a thousand years and, and, and get over yourself for five seconds. And so I said, okay, if that's how I'm going to have to do it, right? To stay in this game and, and to do it my way. So we take a, an extremely long view of Terrapin, which can be a little scary sometimes, right? Because you're like, you know, you're a new company and you're like, Oh my goodness, you know, Jason's over here talking about a thousand years from now. But it's mm -hmm. like, look, that's how far our vision is. I tell people a lot of times, I don't start thinking until 10 years out, right? It's like, okay, well, what's it going to look like in 10 years? And so that is my sort of conspiracy to change the world is, hey, you know, especially if you have children, but you've got to start thinking 10, 100 years, a thousand years out and stop thinking 10 seconds out. Yeah, no, that will. You might not have been ready for that, but that was a great answer. <laughs> it, I told you, be careful. Don't ask me my opinion. I might tell you. <laughs> One thing that, that kind of sparked in me was I'm a pretty big sci-fi nerd. And the cool thing about science fiction is the author or the creator, the, you get to see their creative vision of the way that humanity goes. You, you know, the technology, the, the culture, the you know uh political climate all that stuff and um so many so much of the time there's always that big gap for me it's like this is where we're at right now mm -hmm. this is that future that was envisioned like there's right now there's the path is very not it's not clear at all right. it's kind of like this is where we're at and we're just gonna tank and kill all, right. of, all of ourselves <laughs> this is like unachievable this is like you know a one in a billion chance we get to this like nice society that's not perfect but very advanced <laughs> right right and yeah, yeah and I think that's because of the short-term thinking just very nearsighted everything's about those quarterly earnings or my stock tanked 100 grand a day or you know you hear all the all of the noise that people make about stuff like that up down whatever and yeah well I you know a good example of that is you know I remember in the in the early stages of COVID and people would say like, oh, we got to lock the country down, lock the country down. And I'm not, you know, speaking of for or against, you know, lockdowns. Um, but I would talk to somebody and they'd be like, oh, we need to lock down, shut the economy down, stick everybody home, send them checks. And then his 401k collapsed by, you know, 40% in an afternoon. Yeah. And he goes, my, you know, they ruined my 401k. And I'm like, no, they did what you asked, you know, <laughs> like, so you've got to, you know, like, and so government can't, has to be responsive but it can't be too responsive, right? And it does have to take, and I, and I talked to a lot of companies about this, is like, you've got to understand where they're coming from, right? They're a human being too. And the difference between you and them is that if they do something wrong, there's probably a criminal statute on the other side of it, right? If like, you know, if they make a business decision and don't do exactly what they're supposed to do, right? Like they go to jail, they lose their pension. And so like think from the other person's perspective. And I think sometimes that's missing. And, and so again, I don't mean to think that it's like some type of a novel idea, but at the same time, it's like, you know, hey, if, if we stop approaching someone as a left or a right or a blue or a red or, you know, good or bad, 
um, and start, you know, teaching, you know, addressing people as people, I think, the, you know, our, our possibilities are limitless. And to your point about sort of the science fiction model is I think everybody is afraid that we're going to go the dystopian route, right? And, you know, technology or that short-term thinking could take us there. And again, we've taken a bullish view on those things. We think that leads to a human, you know, led future that is a human focused future. And that there's something, there's something to be bullish about technology. You know, nobody would argue that airplanes have limited human, you know, freedom and ingenuity. It's expanded, yeah. right? Cars, whatever. So, um, you know, nobody would think that your cell phone is taking away your humanity rather than, you know, than expanding it. And so as long as there's, you know, the proper ethics, rules, regs, um, you know, accountability, we shouldn't fear technological advancement. We should push it. Yeah. Yeah. That analogy that you gave of the lockdown reminded me of just kind of like a Halloween scenario where a parent lets their kid have, you know, a bowl of candy for dinner in the, <laughs> in the form of government checks and all that. And then the kid has a stomach ache in the form of a 401k dipping 40%, you know? And right, right. the question is, does the kid learn, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully it's a situation where it's like, parent catches kid with cigarette and makes them hold, smoke. Them <laughs> they never touch cigarettes again. <laughs> right, absolutely. I hear that never works though, but who knows? <laughs> sure <it doesn't. laughs> oh, but um, that's great. It's great to have just that insight. One thing I wanted to flow by you, I came across this in uh, an interview I watched with Elon Musk years back. He threw out the idea of having kind of a sundown on legislation. Um, right, right. Yeah. Instead of legislation basically being a ball that a snowball that just rolls down the hill and gets bigger and bigger to set to in, in your example of the fertilizer company, you know, like, yes, we'll pass this legislation to relieve your industry and let you keep operating. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, our projections show that the economy is going to recover in right. about two and a half years and we're going to do a sundown on it then where it'll come up for reevaluation. Are we going to keep it? Has industry industry recovered, and can it sustain the blow of having this legislation go away, or is or is it you know necessary to kick the can on this sundown? And that way, it would be this like instead of the snowball of legislation, it would be this kind of like ever morphing thing that kind of adapts to society in, in those right. ways, and there wouldn't be those really old rules on the books where like women can't vote or you know like. I guess that one was overturned, but you know how you hear about these little. Oh, yeah. You hear them every once in a while. It gets, gets kind of scary. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Parks and Rec does a really good job in, in Pawnee, Indiana. It's mm -hmm. a, I don't know if you've come across the show, but they always mm -hmm. have these really funny old, really old legislation rules that never got passed, like overturned. But it's like if if a man speaks, then a woman can't do this or that in <laughs> the council room. Like there's just things right. like that that never right. got overturned. Um, but yeah, anyways, just your thoughts on, on that. Is that a disaster or? No, it's a, it's a super good question and a super good point, but it's, there's a nuanced answer and a, and a friend of mine who's a regulatory scholar would maybe yell at me for saying it exactly like this, but sometimes, you know, sunsetting is, is a great idea at the federal level in, in a lot of cases. And this is sometimes why you see these like massive bills that like, like, why is it 5,000 pages? We just need to, you know, give some money to one particular agency. It's like mm -hmm. those programs that are authorized are maybe 50, 60, 70 different types of programs. And so rather than an agency wasting their time to designing and developing a new program, right, you just maintain you know, the authorization of an existing one. But what happens is you get these things called ghost programs or ghosts, you know, like that have sunsetted and they're still being funded. They're not authorized. Maybe they're like, basically, you know, there's nobody overseeing it. It's just the money flows into a different organization. And, you know, Congress may or may not know. And so when they do a review, you know, the executive has to come back and say, oh, yeah, well, we streamlined this. Um, you know, so we've been putting money into something else. And that's why there's the House of Representatives to a certain extent, right, is you've got, you've got the purse, right, but you've also got the oversight. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, that's why, you know, the Congress sees its role you know, again, as, hey, okay, we're overseeing you, so we're going to hand you the cash. And, and that's where a lot of these fights can sort of happen, where something like Department of Defense, for example, so every year they need to get new authorizations, right, or new programs need to be authorized. I think DOD is, you know, and some people may disagree with me, but 
DOD is pretty responsive in the sense of like, you know, how they can turn around technology and they've got some, you know, tricky systems for acquiring resources or, or, or authorizing new programs, and, but where they can fight wars pretty fast, that's pretty clear. So our regulatory state is pretty responsive and we're adapting to things more quickly. And I think what a lot of regulators like to see themselves as being like upstream on a particular product so, or a problem. So if you've got, oh, you got climate change or if you've got income inequality or wealth gaps in a particular space, that regulatory state, it's against their incentive to want to lose that authority and lose that power and lose the ability to snap back that, that authority or that authorization that they had received. And Congress will, can really quickly approve you know, a reauthorization in the case of an emergency. We saw that with COVID. We saw that in, in Russia, uh, Ukraine crisis, or um, I mean, I can name a hundred other times before. And so sunsetting is a really good idea until the bottom drops out. And what we've seen in the last 15 years is the bottom drop out continually. But back to my regular scholar, uh, regulatory scholar friend, what he would tell you is, you know, one pebble in a stream is fine. A billion pebbles in a stream, you've got a dam, right? And so what government needs to be careful of, and this is where government affairs people come in, um, and you know the legislature too, but is... What government needs to be careful of is once those that regulatory burden gets too heavy and you can sunset a reg, even if it's just a dead one, you should be getting rid of that. And some of the most successful governments, you know, state uh, governments in the, or, or provincial governments in Canada have found those sunsetted regs or rules and like, hey, nobody, you know, we don't even need this law. We don't even want it on our books. Get rid of it. And you see economic activity, you see quality of life and freedom increase because the government's not thinking about how can we overregulate somebody, they're thinking about how can we underregulate them, how can we, you know, spur advancement and innovation. And so the startup world, right, really depends on that ability to innovate. And, you know, America more than maybe any country in the history of the world has needed to be able to innovate. And so, shockingly, we have a regulatory state that doesn't reflect that. And so there is a balance. I think the regulatory state is kind of winning that fight right now. Um, we're obviously, you know, Section 230 or certain exemptions that, that tech, um, tech companies have don't necessarily apply to every type of startup, right? It isn't necessarily a one size fits all regulatory scheme. So sure, Facebook and Twitter can do whatever they want, but, you know, a startup over in the, in the med tech space is spending decades jumping through regulatory hurdles. So like I said, it's not a one size fits all. And so I think that like, and the same thing on the sunsetting of a reg, it should happen, it should be reviewed. What we find is that in a lot of states that do pass sunset rules or do set those reviews, the legislature doesn't do a great job of enforcing it. And so they're, you know, Elon's right about just about everything. And I would agree with him on this one, but it, it's a little more complex, I think, than he wants to make it sound. Yeah, yeah, that would definitely be difficult. Yeah. Tagging whether or and when a reg needs to be adjusted or, right. or chopped up or given, given the ax um, and then having the discipline to actually, you know, when that calendar, you know, ping pops up and says, right. go back and do what you said you were going right. to do to actually do it. And I say, I'm actually really busy right now. Right. There's this whole like pandemic that. thing going on. Right. <laughs> right. You don't want to yeah. do that right now. There's always, yeah. Um, so yeah, let's get to your stack. Um, Tell me some of the cool things that you've uh, developed and, uh, you know, what you're excited about there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, this is, I mean, what we spend most of our time on is, you know, internally, right, is trying to help identify and really tighten down. And, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit maybe about like where we're headed with it, you know, but what we've we kind of covered like, you know, the on-ramp, off-ramp a few minutes ago and sort of like, the stages of government affairs. And so, like I said, we have a product for each of those phases mm -hmm. and a lot of pain and suffering went through, you know, designing and developing was a lot of trial and error. Um, you know, I joke that I was, if I was only half as smart as Thomas Edison, you know, I, I'd be there. But is what you realize is that, you know, what I say and my, my, uh, my staff will cringe when they hear this, uh, but as you know, we're, we're like SpaceX, we're crashing rockets. And, you know, the government, they, they want to get everything right the first time. And no, we're mm -hmm. crashing rockets. We're going as fast as we can, trying to get to that right answer. And in government affairs, that's like a, I mean, 
talk about a conspiracy. I mean, that's, you know, as far away from how most government affairs people um, maybe normally would talk. Yeah. And, but again, why we looked at it that way was, okay, well, we need to know exactly what this audience needs and what this person needs. And that really, because that's really at the end of the day what it is, is who is that person and what do they need? What does their company need? Um, you do this every day, right, with, with your clients. And, you know, yeah, there's a system that you follow and maybe there's a process that you have, but you also got to connect with that individual and, and that and your products and your services need to reflect that. And so we've taken these, you know, the different phases, right, sort of that initial um, phase, that snapshot phase, okay, now we're going to pull ourselves upstream, right? Um, we want to, we want to, st you know, strategically plan. Um, too many people want to just get going and start making phone calls right now, right? When at the same time, um, or, you know, start blowing up, you know, people's email boxes that there's absolutely a time and a place for that. But sometimes you got to like, make sure that you know what the shot is. Then you, you enter, because that's when you enter that operational phase, you've got all, you know, everything lined up because you've taken the time to set those initial conditions. Mm -hmm. And, so what we're in the process of doing is, so we have, you know, we, had, we leverage uh, analytical software, legislative tracking, regulatory tracking. Um, you know, we're in the process of, of developing a database of all of the different sort of issues and things that we're sort of running into. And we're designing what could be called, you know, an e-commerce platform for government affairs that people will be able to leverage to design you know, or even identify design develop and execute their government affairs strategy. And so like you said, we're, we're not the old guy at the bar across the street from the Capitol, you know, like, oh, go in and talk to old Corky, you know, he's, he's the guy that can get it done for you. Yeah. We're actually yeah. developing a 21st century technological platform for people to engage in government affairs. So it's gonna take us some time. And there's a lot of advanced, you know, ledge tracking and services out there. We're not trying to replicate those. those they do a great job and they should be where they are. We're looking at in integrating in a whole different way. So we've got those services, you know, today, right, live, there's automations and we have, uh, you know, we have our stack and the technology behind it. Uh, but where we're really going is, is, in, um, is in a platform space and uh, to make it so everybody can engage in government affairs. That's great. That's great. Yeah, because right now it's, you know, a, a small business, I'd say, you know, unless your revenue is hitting 5 million, you're probably, government affairs is the last thing on your mind. Right. Even at 5 million, it's probably just a small kernel starting to grow. Right. Um, it's those 100 million in revenue in your companies that are like actually putting out that, you know, or I guess thinking in that context of what, what do we need to change to clear our path a little bit? Right. Right. And yeah, you know, but yeah, one of the things with that, though, real quick, is I think you're making a great point is, but who is writing the rules? The hundred million dollar, hundred billion dollar company, mm -hmm. right? How does that one million dollar company ever, you know, they're, they're, the incumbent is writing the, and creating the barriers to keep them out. And so yeah. they don't need to be spending 100% of their revenue. They could spend, spend a sliver uh, or, or divert a little bit of resource um, so you're engaging where you can. And so you're knowledgeable about why something is a problem. And so you can adapt, right? And you can say, oh, okay, well, this is closed off for me. It would be, you know, uh, I don't know how much you know about corn seeds, but, you know, up here, everybody talks about Monsanto's corn seeds and there's been some controversy about it. And it's like, it would be like a smaller farmer just continuing to try to use the Monsanto seed, even though they know that's not right. And so I think that that's, we talk to, you know, startups every day that are starting to get that and like, okay, well, I don't need to spend a hundred percent of my revenue on this, right. But I can, I can invest something here and identify a market opportunity, but also mark, you know, identify where I shouldn't go to. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot to be said about the, those trade groups that right. can kind of, that do. It, they almost act as the outsource for a group of small businesses to keep their interests aligned with, you know, at least have some sort of representation. And if, you know, regulation has to happen or at least needs to be pushed for, there's that. But yeah, it's hard because large businesses are so well organized 
and have a department that's just laser focused on on that they're a machine where they take in what you know the company wants to happen and they you know de deploy in, in that but the small businesses it's kind of like you know they there's just not the organization you know the trade groups right. are are great and and they do get stuff done um but yeah it's and, and small businesses outnumber larger businesses in terms of employment and revenue and all that. But it's but it's just the you know everything's decentralized from one company to the next, and it's almost like sure. company A and company B are two, two small businesses in the same industry, and they're so focused on competing with each other right. that they're not seeing that the giant organization, the giant corporation right. that's um, passing all this legislation just to shrink them. Right. And guess what happens when those when company A and company B grow, they create barriers to entry to keep company C and company D out. You know, it's it, you sort of pay it forward a little bit, and you know, to a certain extent, that's healthy, right? And it's good. It's because it's essentially saying, hey, like this is the established technology. This is the under, you know, this is what everybody agrees on. We've gotten you know some alignment, maybe from a public or a policy perspective. Like, hey, this is the way we're going to go. Sort of like how driverless, into your Elon Musk point, but how like driverless cars are starting to eclipse, you know, um, combustion engine cars, right? Um, there was, you know, there was protections around horse and buggy days, right? Then the car became, you know, then there was the taxi cab medallions and the taxi cab associations, and they're not quite as powerful anymore, you know, as Uber and Lyft come on. So the, that regulatory, you know, those barriers to entry actually probably made Uber and Lyft stronger, right? And it made them advance their technology more quickly mm -hmm. um, than they otherwise would have. And so, yeah. And you know, another thing about associations is they're great. You know, part of one, and I have no problem. But what they're really meant to do is obtain alignment. And and this is what you know, members of associations need to understand about them, is they've got maybe four or five hundred members. They've got to keep you know people happy and yeah. um, and and support all of their companies. And so somebody's going to lose in that equation. And so it's incumbent upon you to be advancing your company's mission and use that association as a resource and as a friend, right? Because that's what they are. Um, but you can't, you know, outsource all of your government affairs to them. Um, that's not fair to them, right? They can't do that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I think that's about all I've got question-wise. Um, certainly could go more into talking about the government, but I think we all have stuff to get done. So. Um, <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. Did you have any closing thoughts? No, just use GSA Focus if you can. Josh is a great guy. I really appreciate the time. This was this was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I think the most important thing is for companies to remember, again, you don't need to spend all of your resources into government affairs. It should be a sliver of what you're doing. And especially early on as a startup, but as, you know, 2008 taught us anything, 2020 taught us anything that the ROI on government affairs or even just engaging, right? And, and knowing what's coming and knowing, you know, where things are headed. Your ROI is an order of magnitude higher if you engage in government affairs than if you don't. And so, you know, and that's what Terrapin is trying to do, right? Is help, um, help startups get into that space. You know, we're a startup built for startups, right? Our stack is, you know, yeah. all the stack, you know, for more than one reason. Um, so yeah, but no, but just thank you so much. Um, and uh, really appreciate the time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jason. And um, if somebody watching wants to get in touch with you, government affairs question, or learning about your tech that's coming out, or or anything, uh, you know, how would they get in touch with you? So the easiest way is terrapinstrategy.com. Uh, find me on LinkedIn. It's got some crazy numeral thing after my name on it. So just Jason Fry on LinkedIn or Terrapin Strategy on LinkedIn. And yeah, that's pretty much um, our footprint. We're uh, one of my staff keeps telling me we need to get on TikTok. I'm not entirely sold quite yet, but we'll see what happens there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been asked, you know, why aren't you on Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff? And I mean, I I ran uh, ad tests in Facebook and they and they failed. So I don't right. think I don't think the G I don't think the a lot of the government decision makers in the GovCon industry are on TikTok, you know. Maybe, maybe their kids are, you know, that might help. You know, Gary V says to, you know, go to the kids, you know, that that helps. <laughs> it, yeah, 
Yeah, it would be just like government affairs, a very long term investment, you know. Right. <laughs> 30 year lead time the next you awesome. got to start targeting the next generation <laughs> right <laughs> uh, well thanks josh really appreciate the time all right thanks a lot jason all right be well